investing in emerging markets. You know, we've spent a lot of time looking at Latin America and Asia, but what about investment opportunities in Africa? My next guest's Do It Africa in Opportunities Fund has outperformed 91% of its peers year to date. Ayo Salami is the chief investment officer at Do It Asset in Management, and he's been watching African equity markets for more than a decade. Ayo, welcome to Bloomberg. Good to have you with us. Well, thank you very much. Give the case for Africa right now. We're talking not just sub-Saharan Africa, meaning necessarily South Africa with its gold and mining operations, but we're talking about places like Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal. Is there a change in the market forces at work in these countries? Very big change. And um, I think investors are just beginning to be aware of the fact that the continent has changed radically over the last 10 years. Probably if I had to make the investment case for Africa, it has two main strands. One is the growth of the continent and the other is valuation. In terms of growth, the continent has undergone very significant structural changes over the, between the late 80s and early 1990s. And since 1995, GDP growth has exceeded population growth in Africa, so that we've had 14 consecutive years of real growth in per capita GDP. And that growth has begun to translate into rising consumer demand, so that a lot of African countries today, are, they, you have a robust domestic economy, uh, domestic demand is rising, corporate profits remain very, very high, and probably one of the best kept open secrets of uh, markets today is that uh, Africa is probably one of, uh, in terms of return on investments, African equities have offered, with the exception of Latin America, they've been the second best performing region globally over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and then the second strand is valuation. As of today, since, since 2008, there's been a divergence between the performance of the equity markets and the performance of the companies. So that while company, corporate earnings have continued to rise, the stock market has stalled, and that's largely been a liquidity-driven event. Uh, investors have been risk-averse, and they focused on large markets and large stocks, and Africa has been overlooked. So you'll find today that Africa is one of the few places left in the world where you can still buy stocks where earnings are growing at double-digit rates, over 20%, and yet these stocks are still trading on the typical P's below 10 uh, you don't find that sort of opportunity again. Uh, I mean, the average dividend yield on African stocks is about 4.5% in U.S. dollar terms. And yet they're trading on P's which are below 10. Um, that is a compelling valuation case. And that valuation gap, I think, will close as we move, I mean, as, as investor risk appetite begins to rise again and people begin to, and people begin to take another look at the fundamentals of that, of the, of the African investment and African continent itself. I think we're going to see uh, 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 Africa has a lot of catch-up to play with the rest of the global emerging markets. Now, you mentioned domestic demand, and that seems to be a key because it's not just export-oriented uh, uh, companies like yeah. oil in Nigeria or indeed mining operations in Congo or in, in South Africa. And in fact, one of the companies I know you've been paying attention to is the bank in uh, Kenya yeah. uh, having to do with domestic loan demand, yeah. and you're seeing an increase there. Uh, um, the this is the, the equity bank. Equity bank. Equity bank in uh, in Kenya has one of the most unique models for uh, banking in in, invest, in emerging markets that I can think of. They have a very unique business model because most uh, banks in emerging markets play what I call the T bill game, whereby you you collect deposits at uh, low cost deposits where your cost of funds are less than two percent, and you invest in government T bills because rising inflation means that T bill rates are quite high, and you sit on it large net interest margin. But Equity Bank has gone the other way and they've decided to focus, to, to construct themselves as a retail bank. So that 90% of their deposits are retail and over 80% of their loans are in the retail segment. And they've developed innovative ways of reaching uh, segments of the market uh, which you, we, we, where traditional banking services are not usually available, so you have mobile banking units. They use uh, cost, you know, they use shops as uh, as retail outlets, so that their their average cost of operation is much lower than that of most other banks in Africa, and they've been generating earnings growth, which uh, you know, when you look at the numbers, it just seems too good to be true. Last year, EPS growth, earnings per share growth for Equity Bank was over a hundred percent. Over a hundred percent. Over a hundred percent. 
thing. All right. And I, you were talking about the Equity Bank in uh, Kenya, in uh, Nairobi, but also you cover what's also going on in, let's say, Senegal, Sonatel, which is the telecom operator, and there you've got dividend payments as well as a big investment from France Telecom, owning almost 40, a little bit more than 40 percent of the shares. Yeah. Um What's, what's attractive about Sonatel is that it fits um, a, a model which we have that when we look for companies to invest in, we're looking for companies that have pricing power, which means they are dominant in their market. And Sonatel operates across four African countries, uh, Senegal, Mali, Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. It has more than 70% market share in each one of these markets. And the interesting thing about African telecom companies is that while globally telecom companies have become ex growth, almost they're just dividend paying companies. African telecom companies are still in a very, very strong growth phase. Uh, their, voice de their voice penetration is still less than 50%, but more fantastic and more interesting opportunity lies with data. And as you look at the accounts and the financial performance of African telco companies, you see data coming through very, very strongly. And te uh, Sonatel represents that unique uh, investment opportunity, which it's rare when you are an analyst and you come across them. A company growing earnings at more than 20% on a price earnings ratio of less than 8 and paying a dividend yield of 12%, where the dividend yield is greater than the PE ratio. You don't tend to find a lot of those. And especially when you find a simple operate, a business which you can understand very easily as a telecom company, um, investors might have concerns about corporate governance, but it's 42% owned by France, tel I mean, by Orange. So, uh, and and the currency is the CFA franc, which is pegged to the euro. We could have another debate about whether that's a good thing or not. But it's effectively a 12% dividend yield in hard currency. Uh, that makes this stock very, very interesting. I don't think we're going to see stocks with that, that stock at that kind of valuation a year from now. So. All right. So we've got banks in Kenya. We've got telecoms in, uh, in Senegal and other African countries. Yes. But focus a little bit on Nigeria. We tend to always look at Nigeria and its oil wealth. Mm. But you've been looking at Nestle yeah. in Nigeria as well as Lafarge, which is the cement company. What about Nestle, consumer products in Nigeria? That's what, when most, internationally, most people associate Nigeria with oil. But when you actually look at the structure of the Nigerian economy, you find that oil is only 16% of GDP. And what's more interesting is that the local domestic economy is actually bigger than oil. And in that, in Nigeria, what we focus on are companies who face the African consumer and they sell products directly to the consumer. In this area, Nestle Nigeria is, uh, I think I've, never, I've not seen, it's probably one of the most profitable units within Nestle globally. The return on equity approach is 90%. They produce a very small staple set of products, basically food condiments. And they've developed a marketing scale whereby you can get their products um, in the, remote, you know, the most remote. Uh, in elementary. small stores in all small over stores Nigeria. small all over Nigeria. They've developed, I mean, they've broken it down into packaging so if you can't afford a tin of coffee you can buy a small sachet of coffee and that would still you know that would get you through and so there that that widespread distribution network gives them very dominant position in the market and uh, the stock trades uh, I mean the company is on um, I mean you know, their profit margins are well over 50 percent it's a it's an it's a fantastic business and when you go down to Nigeria to see them you their factories look exactly like Nestle businesses anywhere in the world the other company I like like in Nigeria is Lafarge, uh, which is the cement manufacturer. Largely because one of the, I mean, infrastructure is one of the big things that is the, that's a big investment theme in Africa. That's for infrastructure. Yeah, for and infra so you, you've got to produce the cement. Uh -huh. And uh, Lafarge, I mean, I think at the moment they have a capacity of about 2 million tons. They're increasing this to 4 million tons over two years. And um, the, 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 the profitability of this business is again fantastic. Right. It's controlled. And You're going to keep us up to date on what happened in Africa. I want to thank you very much, Ayo Salami, thank coming to us from Duet Asset Management, sharing your thoughts about banks in Kenya, telecoms in uh, Senegal, as well as infrastructure and food in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Come